2013 when we uh, re revamped our mission a little bit and really started to focus on performance education and advocacy. Adv advocacy for us means working on behalf of the music, not only the organization. And so beginning with free concert webcasts uh, and moving on to work uh, developing, uh, telling the stories through online videos of jazz musicians and all the work we do on our social media channels, uh, digital is a, is a major focus. And along the way, uh, we have significantly shifted our marketing resources um, from print and traditional places into the digital space. And pretty much all of that marketing work uh, can be attributed to Capacity Interactive uh, and, and Molly Garber uh, in particular. So uh, I feel particularly lucky because I worked with Capacity Interactive uh, also at a previous job. So I, I, I think I can trace my personal relationship with Capacity Interactive back to 2000 and seven or 2008, early days. So I, I can tell you that in my mind, this firm uh, are real trailblazers in, in arts marketing generally. I think the language is typically digital arts marketing, but I'm gonna give them arts marketing generally. Uh, and th help, helping organizations and, and marketers to get out of their own heads uh, and into the minds and head spaces of our audiences, who are typically more diverse uh, perhaps less educated about whatever particular art form we're, we're working in, uh, and coming from a very different mindset than we are. And so through uh, a very, with, I would say very gentle but persistent leadership and guidance, um, Molly and, and the firm she's at, Capacity Interactive, are really great in leading the way and, and, and really holding our hands as we experiment, test, and iterate in our digital marketing work. So I'm, I'm really excited that, that Molly's agreed to do this session with us today. So Molly Garber is a consultant at Capacity, uh, and in addition to working with Jazz at Lincoln Center, she works with the Yale Repertory Theater, Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival, the Walker Arts Center, and, and many other great places. Uh, and before that, she was a marketing specialist for a national professional services firm. And as I mentioned, she's been working specifically with Jazz for, is it three years now? I've been in capacity for four years. Yeah, and with us. All that time. All that time. Great. So Molly here is, talk, is going to talk with us today about your organization's digital marketing priorities, uh, and she'll present, and then there'll be a little bit of time at the end for for Q and A. Um, so thank you again for being here, and I'm going to turn the session over to Molly. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks everybody so much for coming. We're going to try sitting. I've never sat during a presentation before. Um, thank you so much to Jazz Congress and Jazz at Lincoln Center for having me here today. Um, today's presentation, we're going to talk about digital marketing priorities that are important for your organization's success. So, my name is Molly Garber. As Erin said, I'm a consultant at Capacity Interactive, and Capacity is a staff of approximately 60 arts marketers working primarily in New York City. We work with over 120 of the nation's leading arts and cultural organizations, doing everything from social advertising to search engine optimization, search engine marketing. Um, we have an analytics practice. We do some consulting projects as well. Um, part of CI's mission is education for um, not only our clients, but everybody in the arts industry. And to that end, we host a digital marketing bootcamp for the arts every year. Um, this past year was our eighth annual bootcamp. We had approximately 400 arts marketers and fundraisers from across the country. It's a really exciting couple of days. Uh, if you're looking for smaller education opportunities, we host Capacity Classroom both in our office uh, in New York City, as well as via webinar and um, in cities across the country. And in 2017, we started a podcast called CI to I. Who here has listened to the podcast before? Nobody, awesome, you can all download it now. Um, the podcast is our president, Eric Gensler, 
who uh, started CI in 2007 or eight out of his living room. Um, and he interviews leaders and thinkers in the industry on topics that are pretty broad, uh, including marketing strategy, organizational culture, and just new ways for us all to be learning and growing. It's really just another way that CI is providing access to education and professional development for everybody in the industry. It's really important. So in today's presentation, I'm gonna be talking about two studies. Uh, I'll be referencing them a bunch, so I just want to uh, talk right at the beginning from what those two are. The first is our arts industry digital marketing benchmark study. Uh, we've put this out uh, several years in a row and just put out the most recent study in a couple months ago. And in this, we surveyed 180 arts organizations to better understand how they are using digital marketing. It's a way to identify our strengths and weaknesses in the industry and figure out what we need to be focusing on for the coming years. The second is the Performing Arts Ticket Buyer Media Usage Study. And this was really exciting. It was our first year doing it about a year ago with Wolf Brown. And we worked with, a, with 58 arts organizations. We got 27,000 respondents. Um, and really we were looking to survey live event ticket buyers to understand how they were using media today to uh, research and inform their ticket buying experience. I think something we all do that is a bit of a crutch is to say, I know what my audience wants, um, I know what they're doing. And this was a great way for us to really actually understand what they are doing. Um, so if you are looking for copies of those surveys and today's presentation, we will send that to you. All you have to do is text talk nerdy to me, the number two, uh, to 345-345, and you will get that as well as a ton of other resources that we offer on our blog, the, the podcast, um, anything else you're looking for. We are really into giving everybody the tools that everybody should have. So why are we here today? We at Capacity know that it is really easy to get distracted by shiny buzzwords and uh, new channels that are popping up all the time and articles that your board members send you and you just must read. Um, and I am here to say don't take the bait. This is meant to bring some clarity to what is otherwise a very overwhelming landscape and hopefully give you some next steps and goals when it comes to digital marketing. So we're gonna talk about four specific priorities today. They are mobile, social storytelling, video, and search. But first, we're gonna talk about permission marketing. Uh, this is kind of a theory uh, that um, is really the foundation of everything we do at Capacity, everything we do with Jazz Lincoln Center. So I just know it's familiar to some people, not familiar to others. We're all gonna get on the same page. So there has been a fundamental shift in how we consume media in the world. It used to be that the American family would gather around a television to watch I Love Lucy together, or you would read your newspaper cover to cover every morning, and that was where we got our advertising. But we know that the world looks a bit more like this today. <coughs> Everything we see on the internet is curated. We are selecting our own content, and we are relying on data-driven recommendations, such as Netflix telling us what's trending or what to watch based on what we last viewed. Um, we're paying to either skip ads entirely or we are expecting brands to serve us highly targeted, really high quality content based on the wealth of information there is out there about us on the internet. This is a chart that shows time spent with medium per day. And what's interesting about this is not like the incredible demise of print and radio. They've stayed pretty consistent over the past seven years. Um, but really this incredible spike in digital, time spent with digital has nearly doubled over the past seven years. 
So previously, advertisers would pay to interrupt us while we were watching our favorite programs. But the new school of thought, which is introduced by Seth Godin, is permission marketing. I'll talk about Seth a couple more times. The concept says that in order to win sales, you do not pummel your audience with your message because it doesn't work and they will hate you. But instead, you serve them great content that is appropriate for their relationship with your organization at that time. So how does this work? Permission marketing says that you take strangers and you make them into friends. You take those friends and make them into customers. And then you make those customers into your evangelists. And how do you do that in practice, in the real world? It all starts with content. Content that is anticipated, personal, and relevant. And by serving this great content that your audience wants to consume, you generate permission. And permission can come in several different forms. It can be an email sign up for your newsletter. It could be a new social follow on Facebook or other platforms. It could be just somebody visiting your website and being put into your remarketing pools. And once they have given you this permission, you're able to start a conversation with your audience that is really rooted in storytelling. We're gonna talk a lot about storytelling. And hopefully that conversation leads to ticket sales and delight. Because we are artists, we're selling emotional experiences, and that's what we want our audience to be having, it, having with our organizations from beginning to end. So let's jump into those priorities. The first is mobile. Who here has an Amazon Prime account? Yeah, I do too. It's awesome because of one-click purchasing. We are all trained by Amazon to pay for the convenience of one-click purchasing. It's such an easy, frictionless experience that we've all become kind of uh, brainwashed to expect. 75% of smartphone users have made a purchase on their device in the past six months, which is incredible and just shows that we are all very prepared to be making purchases on our phone, expecting it to be easy and simple, um, and we're willing to spend money that way. This is an example from a client's Google Analytics that shows um, percentage of sessions by device. And in the past year or two, people have started coming to our website more from mobile devices than from desktops, which is really incredible. However, we also know that mobile conversion rates are far lower than desktop conversion rates. So there's a definite nuance here that we need to explore in order to understand the full importance and potential of mobile. Welcome, everybody. So Google recently released a stat saying 65% of transactions start on mobile and end somewhere else, which is a really interesting concept that the user experience does not start and end in the same session. In fact, today's path to purchase um, can be very long and confusing. People do not learn about a present or learn about a, a performance and then buy in the same um, experience. They are taking a very long path to purchase. So let's take a look at what that might look like. Um, I saw an ad on my cell phone on the subway on my way to uh, work in, a morning, in the morning, and then when I get to work, I browse for that show on my laptop. Uh, I talk to my friends about which performance we're gonna go to, and then when I'm sitting uh, on my couch watching TV that night, I'm also on my second screen, my tablet, and I add to cart those tickets that I'm looking to buy but purchasing on my phone is pretty difficult. And so I get off and I make that purchase on my desktop computer. We know that 49% of people would buy on mobile if it was just easier for them. 40% of all site visitors arrived on a smartphone in 2017. We learned that in our Wolf Brown study. But we also know that 53% of mobile users abandon sites that take longer than three seconds to load. 
So this is the stats portion of the presentation. We also know that for every one second in page load time, conversions can fall for, by over 20%. And mobile sites that load in five seconds earn almost double the revenue of sites that took 19 seconds to load. That's wild numbers. And we know that we cannot afford that kind of drop off in conversions and purchases. And so we have to figure out a way to give our audience the experience that they are expecting at the speed that they are expecting. So what can we do about this? Google has given us a tool and it's free, it's amazing. So um, it's called testmysite.thinkwithgoogle.com. And this is something that we can all do in the next week. Go home and test our mobile site speed. And we may not like what we learn, but knowledge is power, and we can all uh, set goals moving forward to improve that site speed. We're going to do a little shopping today on our phone. This is a recording of us buying Virgin America uh, airline tickets. And what's really great about the airline uh, Airplane air flight purchasing experience is that it is select your seat, much like buying a concert ticket. And I want to point out a couple things that are really great about the experience that Virgin America has, has created here. It is, um, there's a lot of white space and there's very little text on the page. It's pretty intuitive. I know what I'm clicking on and exactly where to click. Um, it's a very seamless experience. It flows pretty quickly. I know what I'm looking for. And I am already at the point where I've selected my seats and I am ready to pay. That's pretty quick. So let's buy some theater tickets. This is a client's website and I am only allowed to share it with you because they have since released a gorgeous new mobile optimized website. We're gonna buy some tickets for the Guthrie. This is their homepage. It has so much text on it. It is so cluttered. This is the calendar page, so good luck if you can actually click on the performance you want to be seeing. Now it's loading. Uh, okay, so this is the page where we're gonna select our seats. This is a super fun part. We select and nothing happens and you can see the user kind of moving around, being like, what's supposed to pop up here? Select something else, nope, unselect that. Uh, this is what you would be doing when you're like, I got, what's happening here? Okay, so now the seat map pops up. We know that this process took a minute and a half to complete, but we just learned that users abandon site that take three seconds to load. There's such a, a, a wide gap between those two. This is some analysis from that website we were looking at, and it's very clear that the site underperforms for a non-desktop experience, and just shows us that we really have to be building our sites for all devices. Mobile is not a mini PC. It's a very exciting revelation, I think. We have to be designing for mobile. This is a heat map of where my thumb can reach on my phone when I'm trying to buy your tickets. So if your purchase button is up in that top left-hand corner, I'm gonna click on something wrong or I'm gonna be like, this is a pain in the butt and drop my phone by accident while I'm trying to click on it and I'm not gonna be able to make that purchase. We really have to make this as easy as possible for our audience because mobile is how they are getting to our website. So we learned in our benchmark study that 22% of organizations do not have a responsive web design. And I actually think 22% is relatively low compared to numbers we've seen in the past. I was like, people are doing this, this is great. But we also know that 73% do not have a purchase path that is mobile optimized. So what that means is we're bringing them to this gorgeous website that's easy to navigate, and then the second they get ready to actually purchase a ticket, we are dumping them in a non-mobile optimized uh, session, which is really just uh, makes no sense for the user experience. 
We also know that 54% of arts organizations do not monitor and take steps to improve their site speed. So that gorgeous website that you spent so much time and money building, we have to keep optimizing it, keep increasing the site speed the more we put on the site um, and making it easier for our audience to use. Arts organizations sold 49% of their tickets online last year. It's a pretty great stat and it's actually down from the year before, but I think what it shows is that, again, Amazon is training us all that the mobile experience should be so easy. And then they get to our arts websites and don't understand why it's such a difficult experience to buy tickets. And we have to figure out a way to make that easier for our audiences. Okay, let's move on to our second priority, which is social storytelling. Clients ask me all the time what uh, new social platforms they should be on. I know we're hearing about many platforms released all the time. And the answer is always Facebook. And I'm gonna tell you why it's Facebook. First is the number of people who are active users on Facebook just every day. It's kind of incredible the volume of people that are on Facebook. And that just means that is where we should be investing in our time and money. There's that great myth that people drop off Facebook as they get older. That's just not true, unfortunately uh, for us. Uh, in our Wolf Brown Ticket Buyer Media Usage Study, we learned that while people do drop off platforms such as Instagram and Snapchat, as they get older, they stick with Facebook, which is great for us. We also know that people spend an average of 51 minutes across Facebook platforms today. That is a lot of time in a day. Um, I know Apple has started telling us all how much time we spend on our phones each day. It's pretty incredible and depressing, and I know everybody made um, New Year's resolutions to spend less time on their phones, but we are spending a lot of time on Facebook in particular. And when you combine the number of people that are on the platform and the amount of time that those people are spending on the platform, power is incredible on Facebook. That's just a number we cannot ignore. And we have to start giving our audience the, the content that they wanna be seeing on the platform where they are. So what does this content look like? This is not what it looks like. This is a terrible post, and we're gonna talk about why it's so terrible. The photo is um, dark and boring. It's two photos, actually. Um, it's not about the user at all, the audience member. It's not about, there's no link to tell me what to do. There's no creativity in this post, which is really what I hope you take away from it. We know that when people hear information, they're likely to remember 10% of that information three days later. But if you pair a relevant image with that information, they're likely to remember 65% of it three days later. We can't be ignoring that Facebook is a visual platform. It needs photos that are exciting. It needs video, and um, that's what makes it work best. So let's look at a great example of that. This is a post from the Phoenix Symphony asking me to buy a subscription, which is, has a pretty high price tag that they're asking for it uh, on Facebook. But without any photo, I would scroll, scroll right past that post. With a photo, it invites me into the concert hall. That's thumb stopping, that image right there. It's like beautiful and we all have that visceral feeling of those fuzzy red seats. I think it's a great photo to pair with that post. So at Capacity, we talk a lot about this 70-30 rule of engagement, um, which just says that 70% of the time, we have to be offering to our audience content that they want to consume, content that is for them. And that earns us the right, 30% of the time, to be asking for what we are looking for. So let's take a look at some great examples that live in that 70% world. This is a shark in the Lincoln Center reflecting pool for Shark Week, which I think is just so charming. 
Uh, these are some puns and jokes from Seattle Opera for the pun lovers and all of us. These are some theater pickup lines from the Goodman, which are just delightful and they should be using every Valentine's Day. These are some posts from Wave Hill, which is a garden up in the Bronx. And I love them because they do a great job of inviting me into their world without asking me to visit. They're beautiful. Uh, I live in New York City, so seeing something green is always appreciated. And um, the content just teaches me something, which I, I love to get from an organization. We know that the social sweet spot of what people want is the intersection of what's going on with your organization and what's going on in the world. This can be very hard to do. It takes a lot of planning. So let's take a look at some great examples of how those posts done well. The first is 92nd Street Y, creating this uh, for Pride Week. The New Jersey Symphony Orchestra wishing us all a perfect fourth. Our very own Jazz at Lincoln Center took Halloween to heart a few years ago and created some wonderful posts around candy. And the Joyce Theater, I don't know if you can read the text there. It says, Monday you will not defeat us. And they found a way to take a, a feeling and emotion that we all have every week and to connect it with the art that they are sharing with us. And I don't have to buy a ticket to have that emotional experience that they're sharing in this post. And once we serve that great content, like I said, we earn the right to start asking the audience for something we want, which is typically for them to buy a ticket. And that doesn't mean you can throw out the baby with the bathwater and stop serving that great content. You have to combine the two this is a great example from the Art League selling art classes um, using examples from their students. And I love this from Steppenwolf. It's a backstage video of uh, one of the actors getting into costume. So the first question is always, does this work on Facebook? And the answer is yes. I'm going to share some stats from campaigns that I have run. Uh, the first is for Yale Repertory Theater. They invested about $5,000 in a campaign for Native Son, and they had a nearly 300% return. And for the Kennedy Center, we promoted an American in Paris. We invested about $25,000 and had a nearly 950% return on investment. So I'm sure you're saying, those are numbers I cannot spend on Facebook. And I totally get it. What's amazing about this platform is that you can actually invest $100 and see an incredible return. It, the entry level is very low, which is really wonderful for Facebook. So how much money should we be spending? This is obviously very unique to each organization, but B2C marketers in North America are allocating approximately 32% of their total budget on content marketing, which is awesome. Except in our benchmark study, we learned arts organizations are allocating approximately 10% of their budget. So we seem to be putting money elsewhere that B2C marketers have figured out should be going to content. We also learned that 33% of arts organizations say that creative and content production is an area where they need to be improving. I think it's great that we have all identified our weaknesses and now we need to start taking steps to improve that content marketing experience with our audiences. So back in the day, somebody bought a TV ad, it ran for months, that was all they had to do for their marketing, but today you need to be investing in great content you need to be taking the time to promote that content, and you are also probably doing your traditional media buys as well. So let's move on to video, which is our fourth priority and really pairs hand in hand with great social storytelling. Seth Godin once said, and I'm gonna read this because I think it's amazing, 
The video is built on words and words are available to anyone who can type. They're cheap, easy to edit, and incredibly powerful when used well. But today's internet is based on video, much more difficult to create well and far more impactful when it works. As if we weren't all watching enough puppy videos online, we know that by 2020, video will account for 79% of all consumer internet traffic. That is 12 months from now, and that is a lot of video watched online. So the question is, does watching video actually make people buy tickets? And Google tells us that the answer is yes. Um, users who watched video, 45% uh, of them said they think more favorably about a show after watching a video, and 68% said it actually influenced their ticket buying. So I want to share a beautiful video. It is under a minute, I promise. Um, so let's watch it, and then we can talk about why it's so great. Arts are an emotional experience, and our advertising shouldn't be sales. It should be the same emotional experience that we are putting on our stages. This video does a great job of that, I think. It also, we are constantly struggling when we have um, not the most visual of art forms as to how to make it visual, and I think they did a really creative job doing that. 50% of internet users look for video related to a product or service before they visit a store. We have an opportunity to bring our product and services into their homes as they're doing their research. We also know that it not only drives ticket sales, but it drives, it drives increased revenue. 50% of organizations said their average order value is higher for users who watched a video before making a purchase. So there's a lot of potential here if we invest in video content. This is a stat from our benchmark study this past year, we, where we learned that 75% of arts organizations are making 10 or more videos each year. That is up from 50% in 2017, so I was super excited to see that kind of increase in video production and just shows that we know that artists are seeing a return on this kind of um, spending and it is well worth our time and investment. If you're looking for more inspiration beyond that 92nd Street Y video, we have it for you. Um, every year we create a stellar arts marketing video reel. Uh, there is great video that all arts organizations are putting out every year and we want to be sharing it with you. So this is um, a great resource that you can find on our blog, on our website. Um, and on YouTube. So let's talk about search. This is our fourth priority and I think one that feels like the most technical. Google is our homepage. We know as users we are searching for something that we need, we click and then we go to the performance detail page or we go to the page that has the video we want. People are no longer entering websites on the homepage, no matter how much time and money we spend to make them beautiful. Google tells us that 87% of smartphone owners turn to search in a time of need. So there are two types of search, and I wanna define what they are so we know what we're talking about. Organic results are what gets shown when Google crawls our website and thinks it has found the answer to the question that somebody is searching for, and those are the results that pop up. Paid results are when we say somebody is searching, when somebody searches for XYZ, I want you to give them this answer, and I pay for Google to be showing that. The only way to improve your search organic results is through search engine optimization. We also know that 99 to 100% of clicks for non-branded keywords come in the top 
slots. So I want to explain what this means. Non-branded keywords are jazz, music, NYC. Branded keywords are jazz at Lincoln Center. So if I am someone who doesn't know Jazz at Lincoln Center very well, I, maybe I don't know what I'm looking for, and I just type in Jazz Music NYC, we as organizations have an opportunity to answer a question for our audience they're looking for. Google tells us that uh, there are usually only two ads that are gonna show up in that top spot. So it's really important that we have that answer and it is front and center for our audiences. Because 77% of people who use a search engine in their research are actually buying tickets to performance. It's an incredible indicator of purchase intent that we need to be listening to. We know that 89% of clicks are incremental to organic clicks. So this is also a very technical thing. What it means is that marketers are always saying, if I take out the ads that people were clicking on, won't they just click on the organic results instead? And the answer is actually no, only 11% of the time will they do that. Google has learned that if you remove the ads, 89% of those clicks that once happened on ads just won't happen at all. So it's clearly a, a, a situation that users have become very trained to use, and we have to be serving the answers that people want to be seeing. They're going there for answers, and we have those answers for them. Search is a place where you can also apply those permission marketing strategies that you were using on Facebook. Maybe someone is doing a top of funnel search. They don't know your organization, but they just say, I'm looking for family activities in Seattle. Those are those non-branded keywords we talked about before. Or maybe they say, I think I know what I want to do. I'm still in Seattle. Um, or maybe they know exactly what they're looking for. And that's a bottom of funnel search. And it's a great way to just answer that question that your audience is asking. That's a way to make your strangers into your evangelists. So I hope that this session was helpful uh, in understanding what your next steps are and clarifying what is a very confusing landscape of digital marketing um, and helped you get your priorities in order. So just a recap, we talked about mobile, social storytelling, video, and search. And if you want more, we have all these resources for you. We want to share them. Text talk nerdy to me at 345-345 and you will get today's presentation. Both of those studies that I talked about, which are so interesting, the results that we got. You'll also get our social content calendar for arts marketers. Uh, you won't have to search for the national arts holiday that you were searching for to talk about on social media. We have done all the legwork in finding that for you. You'll get our call to action generator so you can become a better copywriter. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. We have saved a ton of time for questions. Does anybody have any? Yes. Thank you. Great. Sure. You can be. The seeding. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I think something like that could be created very easily through Photoshop. I think um, Apple has put a ton of tools at our fingertips for creating really easy videos. Um, so there are a lot of tools out there for creating great content. And yes, it does take learning some new tools or spending more time than we previously had been spending on that type of content, but it's worth the time investment for you, for sure. Yes. Um, there is no perfect length. What I will tell you is that Instagram does not let you promote any video that is longer than 60 seconds. 
Facebook will tell you ideally it should be 15 seconds. YouTube likes us to promote six second videos. That's the only type of non-skippable video on YouTube advertising, six seconds long. So those are some, some guide rails for you. Nothing longer than a minute. Yeah. I think it's about six seconds, frankly. I think we're all goldfish these days. Um, and if you can create something that is thumb stopping in those six seconds, then you can earn the right to tell them more. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes. Yes. Oh, yep. <laughs> Yes. Not moving at all from the, you know, when you walk into a hotel to the stairs to get to the hotel. And um, um, my, my favorite five minute movie is called Mad Men. Awesome. And what I do, because what you said, um, you want to get information about what's going on in some areas too. Like for instance, the beauty of Mad Men is it's kind of gray area where it's like, what's the truth? It's like the PC9, PC8, PC8. Sure. Sure. Right. I think what you're trying to do with that, with those five trailer videos, is get that permission in order to start the, the longer conversation and to bring those people into your universe. So it could be watch my video if you liked it, sign up for my newsletter and you'll learn where I'm performing next. Um, or it could be, like you said, programmers who are looking to book you could be seeing that. And through promotion on Facebook, you can be targeting those people specifically. Um, you can put that video then in your email newsletter and say, if you're looking to watch more of my videos, go to my Facebook page and see those instead of putting five videos in an email, which is impossible to do. Um, so I think that is the way. Unfortunately, it's not going to go like I watch a video, I make a purchase, uh, but it is an investment towards that purchase. Sounds like you're on the right track. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Do you have a guideline for what percentage of dollars to Facebook and which one? Sure. Yeah. Start with Facebook. Do Facebook really, really well before you step out into other platforms. So from the outset, I would say 100% of your budget should be in Facebook. Um, and and then you know move forward from there. Uh, I think Facebook gets you a lot farther than traditional media, um, which is really exciting. And it's trackable, so you can figure out what's working and not working. Um, so I think for smaller organizations, it's actually a really good idea to be investing quite a bit of your overall budget in Facebook. Um, of course, that all depends on what you have and what you're already committed to, but um, I think that percentage is probably higher than you're thinking it is. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> or or get a really great friend to do it for them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, in the back there. Uh, three four five three four five is the number, and you'll text talk nerdy to me to the number two. Sure. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it back on here. There you go. All right, yes. Um, is there any sort of um, pros or cons to launching any brand new content as on a larger platform? So like, would there be pros to having a, a different kind of back end approach to launching than say like a Canva or Shopify? 
Sure, yes, totally understand. Um, from the beginning, there are always constraints we have as to how much money we can spend investing in making content. I understand that even the best of us can't be making a million videos, different videos for different platforms. That takes a, a lot of time and money. So I would say if you have one great video, put it on all the platforms. That's awesome. If you have the opportunity to be making different cuts of a video or something like that, I, I do think you should be serving different content on different platforms when possible. Um, Facebook and Instagram, yes, you can promote the same video if you want. Uh, but like I said, it has to be under 60 seconds, yeah. Um, so I think from the outset, do what you can within your reach and then, yeah, branch out and, and start promoting different content on the platforms. Think about how you as a user um, scroll through those news feeds and what, what will make you stop. Um, and it is kind of different on, on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes. Sure, I think you said it exactly. Twitter complements the other two. Um, I don't think it's as visual a platform, uh, and I think Twitter is already the people who are your friends and evangelists. Um, I don't think Twitter is a great way to find strangers and bring them into your universe. Yes, over here. That's great. Keep sending people to your website. I think I think that is the the way to go. Eventually, you're going to have to get them off Facebook and onto your website. Yeah. Yes. What do you think about the ad campaigns that Facebook offers? You know, you pay hundred dollars. Yes. Everything. Um, most of what I was talking about was ad campaigns. Oh, okay. Yes. And we run all our ads through Ads Manager. We're not boosting posts. Um, and that gives you just such incredible targeting. Um, like I was saying, we expect to see ads that are specifically for us. Um, and the best way to do that is through Facebook Ads Manager. Yes. You can do boosting um, right from the onset, but I don't think it gives you the same types of targeting. I think you can pick a couple demographics that you're looking for, um, but not necessarily say, I'm looking for jazz artists in these zip codes who have a college degree. Um, you can get very, very specific in Facebook and spend the limited amount of money that you have reaching the exact right people. Sure. 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 The numbers you're talking about are, are how many people you're reaching and how many impressions you're serving. Is that what is that what you mean? Yes. No, I think you should be specific. Sure. Right. Sure. What I would love for you to do is reframe quantity and, and look for quality of the people. You, when you're selling tickets to a show, you have a finite number of seats in the audience. So you don't need to reach thousands and thousands of people, but you need to be reaching the right people. And so try reframing it about quality over quantity with Facebook. Uh, 
because there are 2.2 billion people out there and you can be spending millions of dollars to reach all of them and they are sports lovers and they'll never come see your show. Um, so we just don't need to be serving ads to them, frankly. It's that anticipated, personal, and relevant that Seth Godin says. Perfect. You're welcome. Yes. Yes. So you can get high hits, numbers in the sky, but does that translate to butts and seats? Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sorry that that's the experience you've been having on Facebook. It definitely is a direct response platform. People do buy tickets directly from it. And we know that because we have tracking that can track all the way from someone viewing an ad through making it to your website, what pages they went to, and exactly the purchase they made. And those are the results that came from those two campaigns that I showed. Those dollars are tied back to the campaigns. Um, so it's not just like we think we influenced it. Yes. The arts. No, our research is not jazz specifically. It's, it's arts that include um, symphony, orchestra, dance, opera, theater. Um, jazz has a later buying um, audience than many other uh, genres, I would say, within the arts industry we've experienced. Um, so that could be something to think about when you're placing your ads in relation to when your performances are. But I really recommend doing tracking technical tracking as opposed to um, anecdotal hand raises in the audience. I, I, my friends will do that. Great. My, my suggestion would be is that, you know, if there was the information that you could buy a ticket on Ticketmaster, you know, that's something that you could do and mm -hmm. that would be much more helpful. Because when you look at ad work, you can go in and select that music. Yes. Great. Sure. Our experience is that it, it definitely is direct response and is very successful in selling tickets. Um, I'm sorry that you've had a, a different experience with that. Yes. Yes. About the artist and the performance. Yes. The I love that you said that. And that just sometimes is, you know, it's disconcerting to me as a ticket buyer. Right. So I wonder where that happened to you. Sure. So our best practice is that you actually, um, when somebody clicks on your ad or views your ad, they land directly on the performance detail page and that it is a great page. It has those videos and those um, images. It has information about the artist, information about the performance. It is digestible to read. It's not like a novel on a page because I may not be a jazz musician myself, but I'm looking to buy a ticket to a performance. So I do think, I agree with you, Bypassing that page, though it may take one extra click to get to the ticket buying page, I do believe that performance detail page is really important. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Yes. Awesome. Sure. Squarespace. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Squarespace is pretty great. Good luck with it. Yes. Ideal, sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Sure, oh, yeah, so um, we, for a person who is like someone who is already a friend of your organization, or already a, a ready to buy a ticket, I think um, advertising within a 10 day window is um, a great way to go. Uh, because jazz has, is something that we're like, what am I doing this weekend versus, or for a single ticket buyer, what am I doing this weekend? You can advertise farther out if you're looking to do that top of funnel acquisition work, so bringing people into your universe and maybe just making them aware of you before making them ready to buy a ticket. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Great. Wonderful. Great. Great. Yes. That's great, really glad to hear that. We have several clients who have gone 100% digital and are not using traditional media anymore and have seen great results. They have not seen like wild drop-offs. Yes. Sure, so this is, I would say, um, everybody will have an answer for you on this one and none of them are scientifically researched. Um, when it comes to paid promotion, you can be doing it as often as you want because Facebook is not gonna be rewarding you for posting or, or um, what's the opposite of rewarding, uh, penalizing you for posting too often or too infrequently. Um, so I think seeing a post once a day is great. I would say, again, it's quality over quantity. If you have great content, put it out as much as you want. If you feel like what you've got is stale, stop posting for a couple days and let people get excited to see you again in their newsfeed. Yes, any other questions? Yes. On Inventbrite? Sure. I think, yes, certainly. You could, there are a couple ways you could go. You could land somebody on your website, like your Squarespace page, and then send them to Eventbrite. Right. Yep, exactly. I think that's a great way to go. Yes, okay, we're out of time, but one quick one. Don't do it. <laughs> Upload it to Facebook. Yeah, that, that is one place where Facebook will penalize you. They're head to head with YouTube. Google owns YouTube and they don't like it when you link. Yeah. Yeah. People are seeing it on Facebook, you're saying? Great, who cares? I, seriously, I think um, uh, YouTube 
um, you can send people there. If, you're, if your goal is to get more views on your video on YouTube, then go wild, run a YouTube campaign. If your goal is to get more videos on Facebook, run a Facebook campaign. YouTube campaigns can be very successful um, if your goal is just to get video views. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.